Hello there ladies and gentlemen, I'm Paul TX141 Walsh, welcoming you to an all new World of Warships video today on our channel. In this episode we shall be featuring our Prinz Eugen, a tier 8 premium heavy cruiser within the German tech tree, a newly arrived one. This video is going to form my first impressions of the ship, and we are featuring it at a tier 8 match, a domination game on the map estuary. So what do you need to know about the Prinz Eugen in game? Well, she is essentially a sister ship to the already available, through grinding through the tech tree, Admiral Hipper class at tier 8 within the German cruiser line. Prinz Eugen historically was one of the three completed Admiral Hipper class cruisers, the first being Admiral Hipper, the second being Blucher, if I've pronounced it correctly, and the third being Prinz Eugen. She is armed with four twin 203mm cannon turrets, two at the front, two at the rear. These turrets are rather interesting. They have a range of 17.5 kilometers. Not the longest, I believe that title goes to your Russian counterpart at tier 8, the Chapayev, but still good range. Your high explosive shells are not your main focus. They can only do a maximum of 2,500 damage upon the Citadel, which means that when they do impact in general, they are going to be able to do a lower amount of damage compared to the likes of your Japanese counterpart. But, on the inverse, with that 13% fire chance, this means that you still have the ability to set your foes on fire with high explosive and cause them to bleed out health via that alternative means. With the armour piercing, however, the story is different. Upon sitting on the target with an armour piercing shell, you'll do 5,900 damage maximum. This means that you have the highest citadel damage with armour piercing at your tier with a cruiser. Your muzzle velocity is the same for both high explosive and armour piercing, 925 meters per second. This is a good muzzle velocity and means you're not going to have to wait too long for your shells to hit targets at maximum range. Meaning that providing lead at those ranges is not going to be as difficult as it may be in other cases. On top of this one has to consider that your turrets turn 180 degrees in 20.7 seconds. This is quite fast and means that you can reacquire targets on the fly. And on top of this, your guns at maximum range have a 143 meter dispersion so you have quite a tight grouping when you open fire at longer distances. In terms of the other armaments on the ship, you do have a number of secondaries, we are not going to discuss those today, as we are not going to be engaging our opponents in close quarters, but sticking with the main fleet as we make our way down the western side of the map, towards the A objective, or at least around the edge of it. But, the other armament available is in the form of torpedoes. You have two triple torpedo tubes on each side of the ship. These can do a maximum per torpedo of 13,700 damage, and with a range of 6 kilometers and a maximum speed of 64 knots, your torpedoes are not too bad. It means you can use them when you're getting close against enemy battleships or even other cruisers and even destroyers to cause some awkward situ situations and cause a lot of damage. Your anti-aircraft batteries are quite nice as well. They have a maximum range of 45 kilometers which is a little bit lower compared to the likes of your American counterparts, for example, which have a 5km maximum range. But with your 4.5km batteries, you'll be doing 100 damage per second as standard, which means you'll cut apart oncoming fighters and bombers when they get within your envelope. Plus, with your speed, you have a 32 knot top speed. It takes a little while for the ship to get up to its maximum speed. You'll find yourself getting to 30 knots quite quickly, and then making those last two knots take some time in a straight line. But still, this means very few ships will be able to run away from you, and when you find a destroyer trying to run from you, you're going to be able to keep up with them for a short period of time. Even the likes of the tier 7 Russian destroyer, known as the Kiev, which has a top speed of 42.5 knots as standard. Your rudder shift time is just over 10 seconds as standard, so quite nice, and with the rudder shift upgrade, it drops to 8.7 seconds, meaning dodging torpedoes, and indeed making your way around tight situations, i.e. land masses, is not going to be too much of a problem. On top of this one must also consider that the spotting distance is not too bad in the ship. With the concealment upgrade, you'll find that your spotting distance, i.e. your detectability by sea, drops to 13km, meaning you are going to have a 4.5km window in which to acquire your targets before opening fire if you want to have that initiative against the larger ships, i.e. battleships, and less well concealed cruisers. Meanwhile your detectability by air is 8.4km, which means that enemy aircraft are going to spot you well before they enter your anti-aircraft envelope, but you do have the ability to make up for this to some extent by the fact you do have speed on your side, and on top of this, your ability to shift your rudder quite adequately. I mean, if you are spotted in a position where you just cannot react because the enemy battleships are able to open fire at you at distances in excess of 20km, you can wiggle yourself out of the way of harm. 
So that's our coverage of the ship's statistics. So how are we employing it? Well, I found that this ship lends itself towards longer range engagements, thanks to the potency of its 203mm cannon. You can see here how we're sitting behind a friendly Japanese battleship and a Magi, and essentially dropping a high explosive down onto the enemy battleships, including a Nagato, who has returned fire of armour piercing, and penetrated us for 6,678 damage. And before I forget, let's talk about the armour profile of the Prince Eugen. It is a rather interesting one. This ship is not too easy to citadel at longer ranges, even for battleships in my experience so far. Your maximum citadel armour is 80mm, however you have a decent amount of sloping around this. As a result, this means that if you can angle your ship effectively, you will find that larger calibre armour piercing shells have a good chance of ricocheting off, and even if they do plunge down into the decking, there is a chance that they will not penetrate all the way. We see another set of shells from the Nagato coming over and hitting the bow of our ship, one only hitting and over penetrating for 1260 damage. Of course as you get to closer ranges, showing your full broadside means that you are going to be fish food for enemy battleships and even like for light cruisers who can use their armour piercing quite effectively. But keeping engagements to longer ranges and continually changing your direction and making hard angles for your opponents means that this ship can even take on the likes of the bigger guns of enemy battleships, guns of the Tirpit and the Gato to name a couple, and you can go ahead without fear of being citadeled a good number of times. Every so often you will be citadeled, but it's not something that you're going to constantly be seeing. So sticking to this harassment role down the western side of the map, we're essentially supporting our battleships. We're sitting amongst them. We have a turpitch just off towards our port side. They're not on screen at the moment, they're just following us a little bit behind. And the Amagi is starting to make their way back out towards us to unite with us. There's a torpedo screen incoming, but it's going to run out of range well before it gets to us. And we are cutting our speed just in case the torpedoes did have extreme range, and as a result we would have gone between the two streams. We're using our high explosive predominantly here simply because our opponents are not showing broadside angles. Otherwise if they were, even the likes of bigger battleships with more armour, we could use our armour piercing and try and penetrate and do a good amount of damage. We continue to drop shells on the Legato here, we've already set one fire and we're currently sitting at 29,999 damage. And I can assure you, we will be using our high explosive just as effectively as our armour piercing to build up the damage over time. So it's not a case that you just can't use your high explosive, it is an important asset. But as we make our way to reunite with our Margi, and our Turpits is following closely behind, quite a nice situation. The enemy Ranger, the enemy Carrier, demonstrates its capabilities by sending over some dive bombers. So we open fire with some high explosive for the time being, and concentrate our anti-aircraft batteries, including our defensive AA consumable, on the dive bombers. We take out two aircraft from the first stream, take out another two as well, and open fire on the second stream, ripping them apart. We set the Ranger on fire as well, and whilst a couple of dive bombers did make it to their intended target, we've helped the Amahogi stay alive. And so has our Turpits. We set a second fire on the Ranger, causing a considerable amount of damage, but note how we only did 4,500. Other ships may have done a little bit more. But now we switch to armour piercing, as the Ranger is essentially turning broadside to us, trying to get away. We cause a third fire for another amount of damage, just shy of 5,000, and now we finish them off with armour piercing. Here goes a demonstration of the firepower of armour piercing on this ship. Clean shot on the broadside here, two citadels, and our first ship destroyed. Continuing with the theme of sticking with our friendly battleships here, because of our range and our ability to essentially play amongst these ships and use our manoeuvrability to avoid incoming fire, we are now turning behind our friendly turpits, and we're going to make our way towards the sea capture point. The game is slightly to our advantage at the moment. The majority of our team did make their way down towards A, and we can see that our carrier is safe from harm all the way up in the northwestern corner of the map. But we cannot take anything for certain. And we can see here how Prince Eugen is building up her speed quite nicely, at 27 knots so far. And we can see as we head towards the maximum point of our speed, i.e. at 32 knots, the acceleration really does drop sorry, the acceleration really does drop away quite noticeably. And as we get to 31 knots, it's now a case of literally creeping towards our 32 knot maximum speed. And we're typing into our friendly turpits at the moment, it was pretty epic how we put up that anti-aircraft battery screen for the Amagi. We get no response, but I personally think it was pretty awesome. And it should be noted in terms of your consumables, in your defensive AA slot you also have the ability to put in a hydroacoustic search. We are going with the defensive AA fire because on our captain we are using the torpedo spotting skill to offset. 
Now some may prefer the other option, but this is my personal preference. I like to gear my ships towards being able to take down enemy aircraft wherever possible. And you also have the ability to take a defensive fighter consumable, the other one displayed at the bottom of your screen. We continue to pursue the enemy fleet as they make their way away from sea, or the majority of them at least. And we can see how we can keep the majority of the escaping enemy fleet in range with our speed and our longer range guns. Well that enemy Dunkirk seems to be just sitting right out in the open. They've never really engaged one of these so far, so I'm a little bit perplexed as to how Dunkirk players manage the ship. I've seen a number of guides, but this is the first time I've actually seen a Dunkirk player and actually encountered them in a proper engagement. Drop a load of high explosives on top, one shell hits, the rest of it goes off to the side. Drop another down the centre line, believing that the Dunkirk is not actually moving at the moment, and our friendly Dunkirk, on very little health, is really pushing themselves forward, going to get eradicated shortly. But we set a fire on the enemy Dunkirk in our second salvo. Our ally Dunkirk has another salvo coming in towards them, and they finally get finished off by the enemy Bismarck. And I dropped another load of shells down on the enemy Dunkirk. We can see how with two hits we did 1650 damage, but not too much damage. We're doing bits, and we're cutting away a lot of their health for a fire. The fifth one we set so far. That 13% fire chance really coming in handy. We score four high explosive hits for 3300 damage. So we're picking up quite a bit. Just going to show, once again as we said earlier, just because your high explosive may not be as good as the other nation's counterparts at your tier, doesn't mean you shouldn't use it. Unfortunately, we haven't got the opportunity to use armor piercing at the moment to show how that can be powerful at longer ranges against battleships as well. Simply because our opponents, again, are not giving us broadsides. The Bismarck is, but they are right at the apex of our range. And that means, as a result, we'll probably be hitting well below the upper deck in armor, which we want to penetrate. And trying to penetrate the lower armor of the Bismarck is going to be very difficult. We can see a point our stern towards the Dunkirk, so that way we're not given a broadside, so that way they're not going to be incentivized to use armor piercing to completely shred us or just penetrate us. But we're keeping a small angle as well, trying to make the most of our ship's armor capabilities. Should be noted that you do have 45,000 health, I believe that is the same as a fully upgraded Admiral Hipper, so there's no clear advantage there. I have not actually owned or played with an Admiral Hipper myself, so as a result I cannot compare the two for you. But I believe the Prince Eugen is being sold in the philosophy it has slightly better anti-aircraft batteries than the Admiral Hipper. Don't quote me on that. We dump another load of high explosive on the Dunkirk, this time causing another fire. And now we switch to armour piercing. The Dunkirk is unfortunately turning away, but the Bismarck is broadside on. Let's show what the armour piercing can do. Keep in mind those were fired at just over 15 kilometers. They disappeared, but from the damage indicator, we're going to go from 84,000 approximately to a grand total of 90,000. So we took out 6,000 of their health with that armor piercing salvo. Which means we shouldn't be afraid to use armor piercing on our foes, even at longer distances. We're slowing ourselves down at this point as we entrench our way into C, simply because an enemy turpist is making their way through the central channels of the map from B to C. Now we are anticipating their approach. We are broadside onto them, but our philosophy will be that when they see us and our allies, probably prioritise the closer allies are our friendly battleships. And if needs be, we can use our rudder shift to quickly turn away. We also have to keep in mind that we do have the Dunkirk in front of us and another battleship in the form of the Bismarck and an enemy cruiser in the form of the Otago off towards what is our front at the moment. So we want to keep an armour profile towards them rather than having to sacrifice that towards the potential threat of the Tirpitz. And we do get penetrated slightly on the bow from the Dunkirk there, but no major damage. We also take some shells from the Bismarck, we keep a slight angle there, only taking some penetrations, no major damage, and we continue to make our way on. And we've finally disappeared, I were concealed now, so we can make our way a little bit further forward, using that 13km concealment range to our advantage. The Tirpitz has been eliminated, so the need to encounter that threat, or get ready to, for that threat, has been removed. And we continue to track our opponents here, having high explosive, sorry, armour piercing at the ready. The Bismarck turns broadside again, we use our armour piercing to try and defeat them. Dumping a full salvo in. Here we go. We aim a little too high, but we still take off 4,400 of their health. Not too bad. We aim a little bit lower this time and more towards the bow of the ship. 
Here we go again. Unfortunately, it appears as though the Bismarck turned under our shells and only one of them hit ricocheting off the front. Bad angle. And we almost, almost breached the limits of sea, I head out of it, but fortunately we stay inside to pick up an assisted capture. And we've thrown a couple more shells towards the Bismarck before they can get behind an island in front of us. We do not get a successful penetration at that point, we only take off 974 of their health and they open fire with their secondaries. As we're going to see, those secondaries are going to do very little when they do actually hit only scratching the paintwork on our ship, nothing more. So with the Bismarck hidden now, it is our choice whether we pursue them, hold back until the end of the game, or try to get a little bit more damage out on that Dunkirk. We'll go for the French ship. Reason being, they seem isolated, and they seem exposed. So we switch to high explosive, because their angle is away from us. It is not a perfect straightaway angle, nor are they broadside to us, but they are diagonal, so Armour Pearson is going to have a difficult time getting through. Well, that does appear, really. They are broadside onto us from second evaluation. We stick with high explosive, though, because we're going by the logic that if we can hit them multiple times, we can cause a fire and then switch to the armor piercing if this continues to maximize our damage output. Also, the Dunkirk has been reversing, but I get the feeling, and I did at the time, that they'd be going forward soon enough, and that's a quite a far ship, if I remember correctly. We drop some more high explosive for 2,000 damage and take out an anti-aircraft battery, Helping out our friendly carrier, if needs be. Our third salvo high explosive is making its way in, and the Dunkirk is now pressing forward and turning away. Another fire set, another 2,000 health taken off, but they put the fire out very quickly. We throw in a fourth salvo of high explosive, and we can see here how the Dunkirk is streaming away from us, and indeed turns away from the majority of our fire. We only scratch the surface with a hit for 413. Our final salvo away, we're trying to drop it over the landmass. And one consideration with these guns is their firing arcs are actually quite low, especially at shorter ranges, so firing over land masses can be quite difficult. We pick up two hits there, but nothing major. And with the Bismarck now coming out behind us, we turn ourselves on an angle to encounter their armour piercing shells, which only penetrate through the bow of our ship doing 3,400 damage approximately. We throw some high explosive, but the game ends with our team winning, and it's time for us to take a look at the post-game stats. Quite a gentle match, and for the win, we picked up 379,004 silver credits, 8,964 experience, and in terms of our battle performance, we dealt 107,849 damage, with 118 target hits to our main batteries, 8 enemy aircraft shot down, 1 ship destroyed in the form of the enemy carrier, the Ranger, 7 fire set, 2 citadel hits, and 1 assisted base capture. Looking at the team scores, we can see that we led our team in terms of base experience earned, picking up 1,707. But we did not lead by a huge margin, with second place going to our Kutuzov, only 67 experience points behind. This goes to show how this match was won based on a team effort and gradual attrition, rather than one or two ships paving the way for the rest of the team. In terms of our role, we sat towards the back and used our overall range, while 203mm turrets, in order to gradually whittle down the health of enemy battleships and also assisted in eliminating the enemy carrier. Looking at our detailed report, we have one item to note here, and that is in terms of the damage we dealt using our main batteries, i.e. 78,413 out of the 120 shells that did hit. We hit with 92 high explosive shells for 52,494. Meanwhile of armour piercing, we only hit with 28, in a ratio essentially of one armour piercing shell for three high explosive shells that hit, whereby we dealt 25,919 damage for our armour piercing. What this essentially goes to show is how powerful the armour piercing shells the ship are, whereby in the space of only a quarter of our shells being fired being armour piercing, we dealt approximately half the damage we did with the other three quarters being high explosive. Therefore, if we go by the logic that we would have had ideal scenarios where we could have continued to have dumped armour piercing shells at our foes at a rate of a reload at every 13 seconds, then our damage output would have been significantly higher. And that is why the armour piercing shells are favourable on this ship and seem to be a key trait in German cruisers in particular. But we made the most of our situations, maximising our output with the weaker high explosive attributed to the ship, and therefore we're able to pick up the damage we did do. Looking at our credits and experience, we can see that for a premium ship, the Prinz Eugen can bring you in a nice war credits whereby after deductions, we went away with 334,290 silver credits, and we were also fortunate enough to add another skill point to our commander's collection. In conclusion then, 
As far as first impressions go, the Prinz Eugen has been a good one so far. This is primarily due to the mixture of qualities she possesses, i.e. her speed, manoeuvrability, anti-aircraft batteries, and most importantly, the potency of her 203mm cannon turret. Hopefully in the future, we'll be able to take her into more adventurous games whereby we can make the most of her secondary batteries and her torpedo tubes, but for now that's all I've got time for as I now make my way over to Birmingham for EGX 2016. But, as always, I've been TX141, and if you have enjoyed this video ladies and gentlemen, be sure to leave a like, comment or subscribe for future World of Warships videos on my channel. But until next time, take care, and fair seas.